All right, we're recording. Hello, thank you everyone for joining me. My name is Stacey Nell. I'm the executive director of the Kansas African American Affairs Commission. And I am thrilled today to have on for the second time, the Secretary of State, Scott Schwab. Hello, Secretary, how are you? I am doing well, it's good to see you again. Yes, uh, it's been a, a comedy of errors for us finally to get this recorded. <laughs> I think but we did it, we did it. We're here, we're here. Okay, so uh, I know mindful of the time, I want to try to stay close to a half an hour, so I'll get going here. A brief bio. Scott Schwab grew up in Great Bend, Kansas, and graduated from Fort Hayes State University. Prior to entering public service, Scott was a small business owner and national sales trainer for a Fortune 50 company in the pharmaceutical industry. First elected to the Kansas House of Representatives in 2002, Scott worked to bring local control and funding to Kansas schools while also supporting free enterprise to strengthen the economy. As chairman of the House Elections Committee and a leading role he had for, held for four years, he championed several pieces of election policy to safeguard Kansas elections and the voting process. Schwab also served as vice chairman of the House Insurance and Financial Institutions Committee and a speaker pro tem for the House Kansas House of Representatives. He has served as the Kansas Secretary of State since 2018. I'm grateful to have the secretary join us today to discuss how his office administers elections in Kansas. So... My first question, I know we're, you know, we're, we're, we're recording this at two, but what did you have for lunch? Uh, so we went to the pennant. So my attorney and I had to go over a couple of court cases and some things that had happened. I said, let's just go get some lunch. And so I just had a salad. Sorry to be boring, but I wasn't super hungry, but it was a working lunch. So I had a, I had a salad. The day you were supposed to do this interview, I had leftovers. That was more exciting. <laughs> Are, are leftovers more? I mean, I guess. I guess it depends what the leftovers I'm, are. My wife's a good cook. I, they, it was phenomenal. I was pretty excited to have her leftovers when I realized the kids didn't eat them. Well, there you go. It's on. It's on. It's being recorded now. You appreciate her cooking. <laughs> I do. Fantastic. Okay, so I wanted to start off. I, you know, like I was saying, there is a lot of confusion. I think there's a lot of noise surrounding elections. There, it has been the case for the last several years. And so I, I appreciate you taking the time out of your day to come on and just sort of talk about how elections are administered in Kansas and how your office is involved in the election process. Yeah, so Kansas, first off, the way you voted in the last presidential election is the same way you're going to vote this time. Um, the only difference is some counties like Wichita has, they've gotten so many more polling places. Your polling place may have changed just to shorten lines because Central County was having some issues with um, long lines in 2022. And the commission has addressed that with increased funding to make sure lines were shorter, which I deeply appreciate. Um, but outside of that, you, you can vote by mail, which we recommend don't mail your ballot, treat it like cash. You wouldn't mail cash, put it in the drop box, or you can turn it into any polling place or any early in-person advanced polling place um, in your county. Don't turn it in one outside your county. But we recommend it. Just don't give your ballot to the post office because there's no guarantee on how they're going to treat it. Whereas if it keeps in with Kansas um, ballot custody, uh, there's a better chance your ballot being 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 counted correctly. And you can go to votekansas.gov and we have a ballot tracker there. So if you've applied for an advanced mail ballot, it'll tell you that they've received your application. It'll tell you that your ballot's been sent out. It'll tell you that your ballot's been received. So and you said votekansas.gov. I just want to give you a chance to do that again. Yeah, votekansas.gov, and it's important the .gov because it gives us extra cyber protections. And it, sometimes there's like a ksvotes.org out there. That's not us, and we don't know what they do with your information and who they share it with. So that's why we say if it says .gov, make sure that way you know it's handled by us and is regulated by state law. And then um, make sure you're vote re re registered to vote. If you're 17 but you're going to be 18 by election day, you can go ahead and register to vote. And in make, if you've had a name change, whether marriage or divorce, or just you change your name, or if you've changed your address, you want to make sure you update that information so your ballot can be completely counted. Cool. So, but what's the difference? I was, I was more looking at this idea of the state level. Oh like yeah, I'm sorry. I elections diverged. are effectively, yeah. effectively run at the county level. Right. I always go into my make sure you have all the information right. Oh, no, I job. So I, <laughs> some of the, things more important. Um, we're a, what we call a bottom up state. When Kansas became a state, it was very important that elections were run locally and funded locally. Um, when we became a state, we we're at war with Missouri and the, um, the rebels uh, uh, that were 
pro-slavery in the South and in, in the Confederates. And oftentimes they would attack our poll workers. So we really thought if we had it run locally, there'd be quicker responses to def defend our elections. Other states are top down. So the state pays for all the elections. In Kansas, that's not the case. The locals do it. But what we do is one, we give guidance as it relates to how federal law is interpreted and how state law is interpreted and then process. Because in every process, there's a gray area and we want to make sure it's consistent, whether it's in Wyandotte County or if it's in Sherman County, regardless of population, that they're interpreting statutes and rules and regs the same way. That's what we do. And so then when the election's over after election day, so let's say it's the November uh, 5th election and it's past seven o'clock, they're counting ballots. And then the next, the rest of the week, they're auditing their elections. They're certifying their vote. They're going through provisional ballots. When all that gets certified, it gets sent to our office and the state board of canvassers meets. And we say, okay, we agree with these results. This election is officially over and we sign it and it's done. And at that point, it's subject to judicial review if somebody has a con contest. But eventually, you know, they only have so many days to do that. And then the election is done, done. Okay. And I think you, you you mentioned a couple of words in there that I'd love to give the opportunity to define, because I think these are part of the things that are, are the confusion. A lot of times, um, well, I know this, this this legislative session, there were there were bills can, dealing with the three-day grace period. Yes. So you, and you made reference to this idea of if you have an advanced ballot, sometimes referred to as a mail-in ballot, Mm -hmm. to don't put it in the mail. So yeah. how? So we'll, we'll back up and talk about the advanced balloting, but then I do want to get back to, uh, I want to make sure I don't forget this, auditing mm -hmm. the election and and the canvas. So I want, I want to make sure to go back and talk sure. about those two things, but especially the three-day the, the um, election day is election day type stuff. Yeah, the, the ele that did not change. It, it's interesting on how that argument came about. Um, the reason why we have a three-day grace period is I believe it was in 2017, it may have been 2018, the post office moved most of the processing centers out of Kansas. So there's one still in Wichita. So if you vote in Kansas City area, your ballot leaves the state and goes to Kansas City, Missouri. If you're in southwest Kansas, it either goes to Santa Fe, New Mexico, or goes to Tulsa. If you're in Wichita, it may stay in Wichita, or it may go to Tulsa. If you're in northern Kansas, it goes to Omaha. If you're in western Kansas, it goes to Denver. Wow. So it's a significant process for the post office to get those ballots in. So there is an agreement between then Secretary Chris Kobach and uh, J J uh, Jamie Schu, who's a Democrat clerk out of Lawrence, Kansas, came up with a bipartisan agreement to say, let's just allow three days for those ballots to get back into the state. I will say sometimes they don't come back in the state, even though you did mm -hmm. everything on your job. This is why I say just don't mail it if you don't have to. I understand some people have no choice. And if that's the case, there's that three-day grace period. But use the votekansas.gov to track your ballot to make sure it shows up. And if not, you need to make, maybe call your local county clerk, and you can get that information at that website as well to help them find your ballot and make sure it gets delivered. Okay. So then I do want to talk about those two words you mentioned, the canvas and the audit. So yeah. 7 p.m. 7 p.m. election day happens. The polls close. Obviously, if you're in line at 7 p.m., you're still allowed to vote. Still I know from our last conversation at 7 o'clock, that's when the, the the external drop boxes all get locked. Correct. So, But then what happens after 7 p.m. on Election Day? So after 7 p.m., they're processing um, votes and they're at the, through the tabulator. They're uploading the numbers because the, the tabulators are counting, but no one can see what the vote is. Once at seven o'clock, they turn it on and start counting and processing those ballots and also processing the advanced mail ballots that came in, some of which have been processed before already. And that's what you're going to see is the preliminary results on our website on election night. That's preliminary because there's provisional ballots and provisional ballots mean um, you're voting in the wrong place. It doesn't matter for president or Congress. That part doesn't, even if you were in the voting in the right place, that would still count. So it's what's called a partial ballot. And that goes to the board of canvassers, which I'll get into. The next day we pick a random race. The county picks a random precinct and they audit that machine tabulator. So they do a hand recount. What a hand recount does in that one precinct is they bring three people of two different parties into that county office 
and the clerk holds up a ballot. Say, do we all agree in this race? This ballot says what it says. We do. Okay, there's one. So many folks think that when we're doing these, they believe that it's um, like when you separate a red deck of card from a blue deck of card. No, it takes three people to at least two of the three people to agree that that ballot says what it says. And they match it up with what the tabulator said. This is why tabulators are important. It's like calculators. You know, we trust calculators often more than we trust our own math because the machine is not emotional and not fatigued. It's the machine is a machine. It's not connected to the internet, despite what the rumors are. And so we're making sure that- I'll give you a chance to say that again. Are these machines- If they're not the connected internet? to the internet, as a matter of fact, okay. to even prove the point we passed the law, say it's against the law to connect these to the internet. Uh, the only state that they are connected to the internet is in Florida because that it was in their statute that they must be. So the press can actually audit the machines from their office. I don't know entirely how that works, but okay. allegedly it does. In Kansas, against the law, it doesn't happen. In most states, that's the case as well. And so, um, so they go back and they audit that all 105 counties. If it doesn't match up, they have to audit another precinct at ra random. If that doesn't match up, which normally it's the same error, they have to do a hand recount of the entire county. And that's only wow. happened once in a county okay. commission race. And both of the county commissioners understood what the error was and the loser did concede to the winner and everything was peaceful. And that was in, in, in a rural Kansas community. So that's how we know the equipment is trusted. Plus we do logic and accuracy accuracy testing before the election even starts. And that's in an open meeting. So party leaders can come in and see, see, here's proof that the machine does what it says it's, it's supposed, what, what we programmed it to do. And then the board of canvassers are your county commissioners. So when the, that election clerk is done processing everything, they go to the board of canvassers and any provisional ballot, she explains why it's provisional, or she, he, um, explains why it's provisional and the board of canvassers vote on whether or not they accept what she says and count that ballot within statute. Now, sometimes it, they'll vote on it, but if they say no, and it's a legal ballot, that's going to be contested in court and eventually they're going to be overturned. But overwhelmingly, they just follow statute because they want votes to count. These elect, these Most of your county commissioners are not trying to kick votes out, especially because they don't know who the person is who voted. They're just right. saying, and they don't even know how they voted. They're just saying, here's what was voted and why it should count, or here's why it's not. Like, we got this person's advanced mail ballot, but then they went in and voted personally. They voted provisionally, but the first ballot that was cast was the advanced mail ballot. We need to count the advanced mail ballot. That's what they do. And then they get their tally, and that's what goes to the State Board of Canvassers to certify the vote. Okay. So, and that takes place, that obviously takes a little bit of time. It does. So normally election, election days on Tuesday, normally those board of canvassers are meeting the following Monday and the audit has been completed by then. Okay. So that's one of the reasons why, even if they do away with a three-day grace period, election day, 7 p.m. at election day. It's not going to be election day. No, because right. the state even, board of Even 9, 9 p.m. at election day, it's not potentially not going to, to be solid. Right. So it's one of those popular phrases, but it's it's always been done this way. Elections, right. they their election day is not election day because we have early voting. And so uh, election day is just a deadline that the voting process stops here. And even that grace period, nobody's voting then. The law is very clear. It has to be postmarked by election day. So if it's postmarked after election day, that ballot is not going to count. And if they're dropping it off after 7 p.m. on Tuesday, that ballot doesn't count. Right. Okay. Yeah, I think I, I, I appreciate I appreciate you explaining all those steps because I know that's something that is out there in the ether. Why do the numbers change after 7 p.m. on that? Because they're not they're not done counting. We're still counting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. I want you to give you, I want to give you an opportunity to back up and explain one more thing. You talked about the machines being tabulators. I know there's lots of discussion about what happens with ballots. I, I live in Olathe, so I know in Johnson County I vote on the machine. It kicks mm -hmm. out the piece of paper. Is this who I voted for? Yes, this is who I voted for. I feed it back into a different machine as I'm walking out the door. So when you talk about a tabulator, can you just explain that a little more? Yeah, let me talk about the whole process. So in Olathe is a good example. Many counties are this way. Some are a little bit, uh, they don't use as much technology, but they have smaller populations, so they're not as reliant upon it. Um, Olathe is a good example because it, it's a, the Johnson County is a big county. There's a lot of people who live there, and that's a lot of ballots to process. So when you go in, you show your ID, and this is what right. helps your elections, is you can say you are who you are, but when they put your driver's license on that tablet, 
it pre-populates your ballot to make sure you're getting the correct ballot. So hmm, where in okay. the old days you would sign it in a book, maybe you don't get it. Maybe you're in this precinct and you should have got something different and it's subject to human error. When you do it with your driver's license with voter ID, it takes the human effect out of it. So it's computerized so that it is making sure that you absolutely got the right ballot that was. For so that's voting. why when I vote early, because I know with early voting, so many opportunities to do early voting in Johnson County, mm -hmm. I'm, I am not necessarily voting in my actual well my poll location is not open because it's early voting right but that's how i get the correct ballot ah see i learned that's, something and this is why it's, those who criticize voter id it's like it, it shortens the lines and it eliminates errors variance and waste and that way we make sure i don't go down and say hey i'm stacy now i want to go vote well they don't know who i am they might think i'm a guy named stacy nell and i could vote in your stead and you go vote later and like yeah you don't get the you get a provisional ballot because you already voted this morning so I have a question that I'm not sure, <laughs> but it, let's, say, let's say I've moved, but I have not updated my voter registration. So my That's address may... Complicated. Yeah, if my address says one thing and populates something, but I don't live in that... This is what's important. So I just renewed my driver's license. So until last week, my driver's license address doesn't match my current address. But I went online to the um, Department of Revenue, and you can say change of address, and they have the system, even though it's not on that document. So when they drive your, put your driver's license number on the scanner, on the screen it says he had a change of address, even though physically on your license it hasn't changed. Gosh. Okay. So that's what, I mean, that's, that's one reason why. That's yeah. So make sure you update your information. You don't have yeah. to get a new license, but you do have to update it. And, and by law, you have 10 days of moving to do that, by the way. So then, so anyway, so now they, they have the card, which has your ballot on it. The reason why they walk you over is that book cannot talk to the ballot marking device or else they'll know how you voted. So that's why there, it's what we call separation. So there, there were, that poll book cannot talk to the ballot marking device, but essentially the voting machine. They put it in, they get your ballot, they tell you how to vote. Here's why these machines are helpful is when you say I'm voting for puppy dog, it puts, when you finally submit your ballot, it puts a burns and X in that ballot. It's not ink, it's a burn mark. So that way there, it eliminates this like, Sometimes like when you have where you check an X, we have errant pen marks. Well, mm -hmm. does that mean they voted for that person or did they just drag the pen? And so these ballot mark make sure there's no question on voter intent because some people don't want to vote for the judges because they don't know what they are. In the olden right. days in Chicago, you could pay a poll worker to fill out the rest of the ballot. But mm, with voting okay. machines, you can't do that because it burns the mark. Again, this is how technology helps secure elections. Every county, all 105 in Kansas, have paper ballot verification, which means you have a paper ballot that is the actual ballot that is counted. And when you put it in the tabulator, it scans that and comes up with the total. And that's why we were able to get results before midnight. Normally, we like to get them by 10 o'clock when the news hits, so everybody's well informed about what's going on with the election. But there are some, are some ballots that people say, I don't want to use that. I want to vote by paper and use a pen. Those are going to be counted the next day. So those are called arson ballots, the ones that get an X burned into it. Well, no, <laughs> it's just a ballot. <laughs> gotcha. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, that that was very helpful. I learned something new. That was fantastic. fantastic. Okay. So we we talked about um, so early early voting in person. I, that is that is my preferred method. I have gotten advanced ballots, the pa the paper ballot, the mail ballots in the mm -hmm. in mail, where I've, I've sat down and filled them out at home. But then still. I, I think it cannot be said enough that, that I do walk it back into the election office most often early. Yeah. Uh, so what are some of the advantages to your mind of early voting, in-person voting? Well, so it's convenience because not everybody can plan to be home on the first Tuesday following the first Monday in either August or November. Um, our situation, we lost a child on August 7th. The election day is August 6th. So if I wasn't the secretary of state, I'd just like to be out of town. So to be with family. Um, so th there's legitimate reasons that you, you don't want, you can't vote on election day. So those early options give you that opportunity. And sometimes with technology, we're getting texts to go vote and do these things. Once you vote, a lot of those texts go away. So if you already know how you're going to vote, you just say, I want to be done. So these things go away. You absolutely can do that. Um, the other, but I, we, the other thing is when you vote in person, that's absolutely the most secure way to make sure your vote gets counted because when you do mail ballots there's several other people touching that ballot but when you vote in person you're the only one touching the ballot 
And so when you remove the human element and it's just the voter to the tabulator, it's the absolute most secure way. It's not getting dropped. It's not getting lost in the mail. It's not getting lost in the mail truck. It's not getting blown out because the guy left the door open. It right. is you vote it, you put it in the tabulator, you cast your ballot, you participate in the great American idea, you can go home and have a Coke. <laughs> <laughs> watch baseball and eat apple pie. Okay, so I know there have been some recent so recent Kansas Supreme Court election um, rulings that have come down, decisions that have come down, and those may or may not impact your office. So I just wanted to give you know. So I know there was one about impersonating um, impersonating an, an elected well, election you official. Like this? You don't want to. <laughs> Well, you already said people might think you're Stacey Nell. So I mean, like, okay. so, but what, so how does, does that ruling impact your office or how does that ruling impact your so, office? So um, there's going to be a stay on the order. The biggest concern is activists acting like they're an election official taking ballots and maybe not turning them in. The law could have been worded better. Um, and that's going back to trial with the guidance of the Supreme Court. The biggest part of the decision was it's not, we have rights. Voting is a right, but so is free speech. According to our founding fathers, free speech, um, uh, rep, uh, the ability to um, petition your government, to assemble, practice religion, those are God-given rights. So according to the founders, those were given, they have been given to us by our creator, and government has to have a very high standard to infringe on those rights. God didn't give us the right to vote. We gave us the right to vote. We could have said, no, we're not going to vote. We're just going to choose random people or we're going to do a draft and they're going to serve in the Congress of the United States. So this is now a political right. Those suing us said, no, this is equal to free speech. Well, that gets really complicated because then we could say, well, then people from out of state can vote here because it's people from out of state can speak can petition our government for, you know, it's a God-given right. My, my 13-year-old and 14-year-old can now vote because it's a right, because they have freedom of speech. The Supreme Court said this is a political right, not a God-given right, and was very clear to separate that. That way the legislature can have some rules. And now they said they can't, they can't make it a high barrier that certain peoples can't vote or the whole population can't vote. Those things are unconstitutional according to the Supreme Court. But we can put in regulations like, no, we have age limits and you have to vote at your polling place. We have a voter registration list. You can't vote for somebody for office that you that wouldn't represent you. Like I can't go out to Garden City, Kansas and vote for Tracy Mann. But if if that if the appellate court decision held, basically it's good. And that was very problematic for us. And the Supreme Court said no, there's a differentiation of rights on that. So it doesn't affect voters, doesn't affect our vote office. We won that on impersonating. Um, that really is more dealing with criminal code and it's going to be interesting how that plays because they're suing on us, but nobody's been charged with that crime. So normally those things don't get challenged if there's actually a charge. So we'll see what the court does with that. Gotcha. Now, I know in recent years there has been a lot of, um, let's see, the, the retention rate for poll workers has, has, you know, poll workers are coming under a lot of fire. So what would you say, what would you say about that? Make your best plea to get more people to be poll workers. I know, I know yes, poll, workers, about this. <laughs> yeah, poll workers play a very crucial role in the entire process. So what about poll workers? What do they do? How does one become a poll worker and why should a person be a poll worker? Okay. So it, we lost more, we actually lost more poll workers because of the pandemic than the current political environment. Um, and so we lost so much institutional knowledge. Now we do have a lot of poll workers. We need more. Uh, you could be as young as 16 and be a poll worker. So if you're a parent of a 16 year old or a grandparent of a 16 year old, you can work with your grandchild child. And so that's kind of, it's a wonderful experience for you. And if you're, if you're a teenager, it looks great on a resume for um, scholarships if you're applying to a qualified admissions university or just a job, because this isn't a political activity, it's a civic activity. Right. And companies and or government jobs that you just really have a, have a high grade for such activities. Um, we tell our young people, you don't have to go to school, you get credit and you get paid, who's in? Um, <laughs> and a poll worker could be anybody from somebody who's checking you in to taking that ballot to the machine, to the person giving you the sticker, keeping eyes on the election that way, all the way up to a poll judge. Because let's say somebody says, well, 
we don't know there's something wrong here and we don't know what the answer is. That poll judge makes a judgment because not there is no such thing as a perfect election, but we do the best we can. And overwhelmingly, except for one time that I can think of, the election determines the winner. The only time it doesn't is if there's a tie. And even in the treasurer's race in 2022 in the primary that it was in the Republican ticket was decided by less than 1%. There was a concession that, yep, that person won, this person didn't. And there was no mm -hmm. way to to argue it because the, 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 the recounts didn't change anything. The Supreme right. Court said the point of an election is not to make sure every vote is counted correctly. It's to make sure that every that we know who the winner is. And maybe this one ballot, there may have been an error. If it doesn't change the outcome of the, of the election, how much weight does that carry? Why would you? No one's harmed. Gotcha. It's not comfortable. Uh, so, it is. It is the truth. We the reason for the election is to determine who the winner is. To find the winner, right? And I think, um, yeah. So I, ultimately, I, ultimately, I do believe that Kansas elections are secure. And so they are. Again, I'm grateful for you to come on here and talk about this. So a couple other things that I wanted to just touch on that I found personally interesting, and I'm honestly, I'm not even sure I want to ask about it because when I was reading about it in the newspaper, I thought well, this would be an interesting question because uh, it's the whole no labels Kansas, as opposed to, what was it? No labels Kansas party Inc., which I'm like, oh, that's sneaky. But so how, do you want to comment on that whole? I can real well? briefly. So a uh, political activist, so we recognize no labels as a party because they got sufficient signatures. They appointed a state chair and we have that filed with our office. And, and that's no labels Kansas. Correct. That's a party. Now to be, just because you file as a nonprofit doesn't make you a political party. Just because you file as an LLC doesn't make you a political party. Walmart can't suddenly say, hey, we're a party. Here's our candidate. What this activist did was file with the business division and file the name as it incorporated it. But just because you're incorporated doesn't make you a party. That's a separate chapter of statute that has a separate threshold. We do have in statute that impersonating a party official is a class A, I believe it's class A misdemeanor, which means it, let's say the Republican party's coming in and say, here's our nominees for the general. Okay, you can do that. Or minority parties do it a different way. Well, what that prevents a person from saying, no, I've, I'm the party chair, I get to do it. Well, if you're impersonating this misdemeanor, he thought because he filed it as an incorporated the name, that meant he was a political party, but they're two completely different things. Just like you can say you're a company, that doesn't make you a nonprofit. If you if right. the company wants to have a nonprofit, that's a completely different entity. And so he... When you try to be cute to try to game the system, it normally bites you because the system's pretty secure. And that's the situation here. So we don't, I believe he probably committed the, the misdemeanor. It's up to the attorney general to investigate and, and determine. And eventually there's jur, jurisprudence on how that will be carried out. But um, yeah, you, you can't do that. And had, had that individual asked if he could do that, we would have gotten and said, said no, but I, I have the smartest attorney working in our office in our building. I, I trust 